first of all, uh, Ollie Jem is here from Brohampton. Uh, he's project coordinator, and they are an award-winning enterprise within the Students' Union here that engages students, staff, as I say, and the wider community in food journeys through practical volunteering, so you can get involved. You can actually grow your own brands uh, here, should you wish to get involved early. The Edible Campus is at the heart of their project, which has allotments, a polytunnel, a container garden, a historical orchard, uh, and a forest garden. Ollie is passionate, as you will hear, about the right, right to food and the role of local farming uh, in reimagining re urban spaces, encouraging climate resilience, important, and strengthening our communities. Uh, Johnny, who will be joining him up here, is a leadership coach, a mentor, a retreat director, and a social entrepreneur. And he's the founder and runs Becoming, which is a practice focused on transformation in people, places, and organizations, curating space to grow compassionate, creative, and resourceful leadership in the complex world. And the heart of that is the project Wayfarer, a personal development pathway, reimagining human ecology, something that um, I know he's learned a lot from Alistair on that. And he's also founder and chair of the Paradise Cooperative. And that's a community enterprise which, again, like Roehampton, enriches the lives of locals, learning through nature and working with the land. And it's part of um, Johnny's side, if you like, provided the uh, baking and the logistics for getting those brownies onto your table. Uh, and Ollie did the actual growing. Uh, Ollie had the mud in his hand. So without further ado, please, uh, Ollie and Johnny, come and tell us all about this. Great, thank you for that, Michael. I'm we're tag teaming, so I'm going to start, and then uh, Ollie's going to say a little bit more. Um, this is uh, less presentational, more biographical really in terms of um, just sharing with you a little bit about our learnings uh, from these two different enterprises, the Paradise Cooperative uh, based here in Wandsworth and also Grohampton. I came to the City of London in the sort of early 2000s uh, with my family uh, with this kind of phrase in my head to uh, somewhat arrogant phrase I might add which was to transform London. <laughs> Big ambitions. <laughs> what, what I discovered was that uh, the real gift of moving here was how London was going to transform me. And uh, I also discovered very quickly the, the poverty of my own humanity and that I was... Um, but really sort of out of my depth, if you will. And uh, I was with a group of friends who had kind of somewhat, uh, I'd somewhat convinced to come together so that we, there was some sort of strength in numbers. And we were looking to, uh, to engage in life in a kind of local place-based way uh, that was intentional and that where there was that sense of, you know, liability and, and availability to one another. And uh, in that context, we came, all feeling this impoverishment, we came across this uh, book that was a uh, sort of set of uh, writings between some Catholic writers, people like Dorothy Day, the activist, and Thomas Merton, and Flannery O'Connor. And the, the title of the book was, Maybe the Life You Save in the End is Your Own. And that somehow grabbed us, and is what, I guess, the title alludes to this idea of nourishing the soul. So we thought, well, let's, let's explore that on the ground in this place, in this city. And we sort of adopted some of the principles um, of uh, Sir Ken Robinson around just listen, uh, try stuff, and be open to changing your perspective. And uh, we quickly realized that we were not the host but we were a guest in this place, and that that way of being uh, really helped us to kind of grow into the space that, that eventually allowed us to form and begin the 
Paradise Cooperative. And uh, some of the people with us were from Michigan, and they uh, had heard about this guerrilla farming going on in Detroit when the uh, motor industry collapsed there. And we thought that sounded, first of all, like a lot of fun, and second of all, uh, sort of a little bit mischievous with the word guerrilla in it. So uh, we have been wanting to plant an orchard of 250 trees ac across uh, the area that we were living in. And uh, so we couldn't get our imagination around how do you do that in this space until somebody just simply said, well, why does it have to be one space? And so our paradigm shifted and we started to talk to schools and churches and other kind of people that held uh, particular pieces of land in the neighborhood we were part of. And eventually came to growing this uh, orchard of 250 trees across that whole area. And it sort of opened up a new vista for us in terms of how to be. And uh, the next thing that we discovered was this church that had a garden that was very der derelict. And uh, we thought, uh, well, well, why don't we go for sort of trying to clean it up a bit and then grow food on it? And uh, let's, you know, they're, they're Christians, they'll forgive us. So let's just um, ask for permission later and uh, get on with doing it. And it actually transpired that they had become a wonderful partner and we began to grow this food. And then we met a person who would, what was really interested in uh, beans and keeping hives that were not industrial. And through that relationship, we started writing to the governor of the prison in our neighborhood and asked if we could have this plot of land that's uh, uh, under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Justice, but uh, managed by them. And after many, many, many letters, they eventually, I think, got fed up with us and said, have it. So there is this acre of land that has become the hub of this enterprise, uh, the Paradise Cooperative. And in many ways, what we learned and what has transformed us was very much from some of what uh, Alistair has written about in Rekindling Community, this idea of discovering uh, a kind of triune base of community that is this full human ecology, this dance between our relationship to the soil, to the soul, and to the society and its social fabric that we're part of. And uh, I know that he riffs off of that with his friend Satish Kumar. And that became a, a way of being human to us that uh, re-energized us and captivated us. And it became the kind of mantra, this idea of in an urban context, working with the landscape of nature to explore the geography of our lives and curate space for flourishing local place-based ecosystems. We're very influenced by the sculptor Nathan Sawanye, who uh, sculpts with Lego. So there's this kind of very playful way in which he works, but they're quite profound in what he's trying to say. And there's one particular one where he's sit, sort of got this character kneeling on the ground with their arms out, but no hands. And it's really this poignant way of saying that our way of being human needs to be more embodied and it needs to be more immersive in the way that we explore a uh, place based living. And we do that with the Paradise Cooperative in lots of different ways with a, with a commitment to learning. And particularly we have a system that works as a, a membership system that works with local schools who come and not just learn about cognitive or functional competencies and capabilities, but that more visceral, immersive way of knowing, a more artful way of knowing, that speaks more to the heart of what it means to be human for these children, to identity and to a, a sense of belonging that is captured in what they're doing. And the other thing, again, speaking to the title, is we grow food. And it's a community venture where you can come and get involved. And we've grown a partnership with the community cafe on the high street who have made these lovely brownies for you today. And uh, every month, that community cafe hosts a community meal. And it's this wonderful, incredible space that reflects 
all the kind of diversity of the neighbourhood in terms of who shows up at it. And uh, I often uh, was taught in my own theological studies, I remember uh, the missiologist that taught us say, you know, mission is defined by an open table. And so in that sense, we've really tried to think about what that means to host a space for an open table where everyone is welcome and fits in. And having that diversity and inclusivity and so that really has been also at the heart of Paradise Cooperative. And I think if, if, if I was to sort of finish by this, it's, it's a kind of a renewed way of being that we're exploring. And it's a kind of, if you will, spirituality, uh, maybe for our times. It's uh, rewilding this unwilded commodification of the soul and trying to nourish it again in that place of this fuller human ecology. I think it was uh, uh, Jacob Needleman who was quoting Black Elk from the uh, Lakota tribe, uh, who said this, the Western man asks of nature to satisfy his desires. The native asks of nature to transform his desires. And it is to that in our coming to London and of the Paradise Cooperative that has been so seminal and poignant to our journey is that it has actually transformed our desires. It's transforming our way of being and we hope as we invest in the rising generations that it will give them a new sense of identity and way of being for this future. I'm going to hand over to Ollie who's going to segue that into Grohampton. I'll just uh, go through a little bit about what um, the Grampton project entails. Nick has mentioned some things already, so I'll speak a little bit about the functions, uh, the service that we offer, and then look a little bit at the outcomes, and hopefully that can whet your appetite for later to explore some of those concepts. Um, so as Nick said, um, we are a food growing enterprise um, operated through the Students' Union, um, so we exist for students and I guess the basis is that uh, the majority of students, and particularly young people, want to see um, action towards um, addressing our climate crisis. So the Grahamton project speaks to that. Um, and how it does so is that we have what's called an edible campus. So um, I invite some of you, if you have time after today, um, to go and walk around the campus um, onto Frobel and Digby, where we have various allotments, we have a polytunnel and the historical orchard and forest garden um, and we offer volunteering for students to develop skills, transfer knowledge in the arts of growing your own food uh, but of course that's a massive subject, it's much more than that. Um, we offer weekly volunteering so students learning how to harvest food and um, sowing, transplanting you name it, um, and in the process, uh, connecting to the soil, uh, which I'll speak about afterwards. Uh, we also have um, a flock of rescue chickens um, and rehomed chickens, um, which is quite close to Hyde Cafe, so if you're on that side, um, go and say hello. And students, staff and community look after the chickens through volunteering, um, and part of that is um, bringing attention to animal welfare and the exploitative nature of um, the egg industry and um, meat industry in general. We don't eat the chickens. Um, but obviously caring for the chickens, that's a much deeper experience for everyone involved. So it's exploring that on a soul level. Um, we also run preserve making sessions. So um, in terms of like functionality of the project, um, we grow things throughout the year. We sell that at the Hive Cafe. Uh, we have a veg box scheme on campus, so that speaks to localizing our economy, um, bringing healthy, nutritious food quickly to people while it's at its nutritional best. Uh, but we also freeze the produce for the term time, and we offer preserve making sessions for staff, students, community, 
to learn the basics of preserving food, and we sell the product at the Hive Cafe. So it generates a small amount of income. So it's quite interesting if you're interested in scaling up the social enterprise. So for the students, that's um, the first time they would have been got involved or exploring those issues. Um, and we also, what else do we do? Lots of different things. Um, we also work very closely with the community. Um, so some of the colleagues here from Regenerate Paradise Co-op obviously just met Johnny. Um, but particularly during COVID, there was a massive material need um, when we saw our supply chain breaking down with the smallest, well not the smallest shop, um, but we just saw the impact that can have on food as well. Um, so donating food to our community, so people in the Rahampton area who were struggling, um, because a lot of people locally work in the gig economy, and that was the first thing to be hit by the COVID um, crisis. So offering food from our local area was, I think, an important gesture. I think it's something to be looked at later in terms of, um, I think some of our speakers touched on this, what do universities exist for? Um, looking at land reform, land rights, you know, we have a huge area here, we're quite privileged. So what can we do for our community? So looking at justice, um, climate justice, um, racial justice, what have it. Um, but, I think it was, just to touch on some of the themes earlier, I think it was really interesting looking at magical spaces. I really liked the um, presentation of Glastonbury because I love Glastonbury. Um, but I think, yeah, it is that um, looking at that question of time and students, staff coming into these spaces just for a couple of hours, but you know, immersing with the environment, connecting to the soil, exchanging stories, building networks, links. Um, and then coming and doing that all over again. I think it's such a powerful thing. Uh, even if you know growing a, whatever, like salad or tomato, it's not the most difficult thing in the world. It's a very powerful experience for people early on in their life, uh, and also later in life. Um, so yeah, just bringing this idea of intergenerational spaces. We have uh, volunteers from the community, we have students, so that interaction about you know, going to uni, what does that mean? How do you connect with your landscape, your local area? What role do you have looking at privilege? There's so many things that you could unpick and unpack from that. Um, I think for our international students, it's a really um, brilliant way for them to meet other students um, from all parts of the world. So that cultural exchange over food, you know, it's such, you know, it's something we can all unite around the table on. Um, so I think people sharing recipes, how they grow things in their countries or their communities in the UK, um, that is um, yeah, so valuable. Um, besides the functionality of, you know, could we roll this out on a bigger scale in Roehampton? Like, could there be 20 Ramptons, which I think we'd all love. Um, so it's as much a model, I suppose, um, not saying we're perfect, but something for people to get excited about and to dream about. Um, and I think now, um, looking at food, I think this, I don't need to tell the room this, but you know, food has been one third of our global emissions, the industrial um, food system. So localising, having a practical project right here on campus where students can apply what they're learning in your classrooms, take it out into the garden, um, us being like a host of people's research, so we work closely with academic departments, um, particularly education, psychology, but even business and law as well. Um, I think uh, we, that space exists for other people to dream as well, um, to show what's possible. Um, so yeah, hopefully later um, we can have a great discussion and we can pick up with some of the concepts as well.